Hello, and welcome to Marcy's with Ben. In today's video, I'm brewing the Pineapple and Palms Tropical IPA that was provided to me by More Beer. And if you want to get this kit for yourself, I'll leave a link for it down in the description. Now, this beer we're brewing is classified as an IPA, but it also can be thought of as a smash beer, which stands for a single malt and a single hop. The hop variety that will be showcased in this beer is the Brew One, which is defined by its key flavors of sweet fruit that are similar to pineapple and stone fruit. The malt for this recipe is 100% ultra light liquid malt extract. And in addition to the hops and malt extract that were provided in the kit, it also comes with instructions, a piece of paper for brew day notes, and a clarifier tablet to be added at the end of the boil. Now this kit comes with enough supplies to make a five gallon batch, but I'm gonna cut this in half and aim to make 2.5 gallons as a finished beer, which means I'm only gonna add three gallons of reverse osmosis water to my kettle. Next, I'm going to adjust my water profile by adding some brewing salts following a hoppy water profile with the desired sulfate to chloride ratio of 3 to 1 and the exact amounts will be listed in the description. Now because I'm using 100% liquid malt extract, I don't need to perform a mash for this batch so I'm just going to heat the water up to almost a boil. And then it's important to note that I'm turning off the heating element in this electric kettle while I add in my extract so it doesn't scorch as I pour it in and it hits the bottom of the kettle. To three gallons of water, I'm gonna add five pounds of ultralight malt extract and stirring it fairly often so it can dissolve as it's added into the warm water. One minor error I did not account for was that five pounds of liquid malt extract actually adds about a half a gallon of volume to the kettle, which would affect my overall original gravity because I had more water or more volume than I thought. Then once all the extract is added, I turn the kettle back on and set the temp to boil. And if you're making this beer at home, just remember to watch it as it nears a boil as once it nears that point the protein break will begin and almost cause a boil over if there isn't enough head space in the kettle. After several minutes the wort finally started to boil and since the only hop addition is at the last 15 minutes I decided to opt for a short 30 minute boil instead of a full 60 minute boil. Then with 15 minutes left adding in the wort chiller, the hop basket, and our first hop addition which is one ounce of that brew one hop. Then with five minutes left I'm going to add half of the clarifying tablet and I'm going to cool the wort to 180 degrees. Then I'm adding in a half an ounce of the Brew One Hop for a 30 minute hop stand to get some nice aroma. And then I'm going to cool the wort down to pitching temperature, which is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and transfer that into a clean and sanitized keg that I'm going to use as a pressure fermenter. As I said, I'm going to use this torpedo keg as a pressure fermenter. So before I seal it up, I'm going to add one half ounces of this Brew One Hop into a mesh bag that also has a food grade magnet inside. An additional magnet will be placed on the outside of the keg so it can be suspended above the wart until I'm ready to dry hop and add that into the wart by lowering it down. And I'll do that on day three. Lastly, I'm adding in a half a packet of the Cellar Science Cali Dry Yeast, and I'm sealing it up and giving it a good shake to aerate the wart. Lastly, I'm attaching the spunding valve to the gas in post and setting the release pressure to about 12 PSI. And the final thing I'm doing today is I'm gonna take an original gravity reading for this wart, which is at 1.056. Now, this is where things got a little off which is always part of a learning curve with new equipment, as this is my first batch fermenting under pressure. So the next morning I checked how things were going and the PSI on the spunning valve read about eight PSI. I did notice a faint smell of hops, suggesting maybe there was a leak somewhere. And I thought it could have been from the lid. And so I sprayed it down with some sanitizer, but couldn't observe any bubbles. On day two, I noticed the PSI had dropped even more down to five PSI, so I knew I had a leak somewhere. So I removed the spunning valve and placed it on a secondary keg that had pressurized to 15 PSI and left it out for two to three hours. When I came back and checked it, the PSI was back down to one. Then I figured out where the leak was, which was between the gray gas connect and the quick connect on the spunding valve. So all I had to do to get this to stop leaking was tighten it down and it then began to hold its pressure. So I reattached it back to the keg and let the fermentation continue. And on day three, I used the magnets to drop the hops down into the fermented beer and let it ferment away at 15 PSI for a total of 10 days. At that time, I took a sample of beer and set it aside so I could degas it and get an accurate final gravity reading. And then I began the process of transferring the beer from the fermented keg. This was done by attaching a liquid to liquid jumper cable from the keg with the beer to the sanitized and purged keg receiving the beer. The full beer can start as soon as the liquid line is connected to the empty keg due to the pressure difference between the two vessels. And as it started to flow, I hooked up an outline to the gas post of the receiving keg and placed a piece of tubing submerged in sanitizer. Lastly, I attached a gray gas connect to the CO2 tank to keep the beer flowing at about 10 PSI. I continued until the keg was completely full and I disconnected all the tubes. 
The additional benefit of pressure fermentation is that CO2 is already dissolved in the beer at about 15 PSI and apply CO2 when it's ready to serve. Lastly, before we get into tasting this beer, the final gravity was 1.01, which makes this beer a 5.8% alcohol. With so all that said, let's get this tropical IPA poured and see how it tastes. And this is the Pineapple and Palms Tropical IPA that I brewed using their extract kit. So the color right away, you get this kind of orange hue to almost yellow, but more on the orange scale. It's slightly hazy, uh, and that's probably due to the, some of the dry hopping they added to it. So this is brewed as a smash beer. It was 100% brew one hops. So I added that in the boil, in the whirlpool, and as a dry hopping. So for the aroma, I get like some bitterness, but mostly I get like juicy fruit and some banana, but it's not like a bad banana aroma. It's more like what I associate with like a blended beverage from like a tropical island that really kind of comes through. It does kind of just remind me of like a fruity, a fruity blended smoothie type of alcoholic drink that you get when you're on an island and enjoying it. And then we'll go in for the taste. You get kind of the, the hops up for it. There's a little bit of residual bitterness at the back end. Overall, the body's pretty light due to the ultra light malt extract that was added to it, which really helps the hops shine in this beer. So you get a lot more on the aroma and then a little bit of that flavor in the um, bitterness and a little bit of like fruity characteristics on the flavor, but it's pretty clean. It's very drinkable, so it's very easy for summertime. If you're interested in this kit, I'll have a link down below and you can get it for yourself. But otherwise, yeah, this beer turned out great. I mean, I think the only thing I would say as an improvement based on uh, the website for the, where the hops are from is that you might want to add Sabro hops as well, which have a more coconut uh, aroma and flavor profile with it, which they describe if you add the, this, the Brew One hops and the Sabro hops, it almost kind of reminds you of a pina colada. So it might be a nice kind of dual hops if you want to expand upon this kit and order those in, as well. But other than that, yeah, the Brew One is pretty good. I think this would go well in a New England style IPA, which is more stone fruit tropical forward or this kind of smash beer as well so if you're interested in this kind of stuff please subscribe to my channel and i'll see you again soon cheers